But thank you so much again. My name is Shunta. I hit up financial services. We have a, a, a great lineup ahead, and I'm going to give you a quick overview um, of what the Databricks Lake House is um, to answer some of the questions that uh, people might have, and, and for those who are new uh, to Databricks. So Databricks. Uh, is the, uh, one of the largest unicorns in the world. Uh, we uh, pre uh, recently raised another round of 43 billion valuation, make us the, the fifth largest startup in the world. And we are a lake house company. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that lake house is. Uh, we have over 10,000 customers around the world. Um, our CEO Ali was on stage on Sunday and he was on CNBC yesterday as well. And you may have heard him talk about financial services as now being the fastest growing and largest vertical at Databricks. And that's been a massive shift um, over the past few years. And, and all the people, I think we have 32 Databricks people here um, at Money 2020. Last year we had four people. So you kind of see the investment that we're making. Um, we, had a, we, had a, we have a fairly significant booth this year. Last year our booth was like next to the bathroom. Um, so we're making a big, big investment um, into Databricks. So, sorry, into financial services. So uh, this is how we talk about the journey that our customers are on today. And we call this the data and AI maturity curve. So if you think about very successful companies that have incorporated data and AI into the everyday products and services that they provide to their, to their customers, right? So maybe Uber is a good example, right? It's literally rocket science that they can figure out when your car is going to get there, when you're going to get to your destination, how much it's going to cost, right? And what they do really well is they use data to make really predictive automatic decisions. And if you look at the spectrum of our, let's say, 10,000 customers around the world, most companies are in that red bucket, right? Their data architecture enables them to answer questions like, what happened in the past? So how many mortgages did we underwrite last quarter, right? How many, I don't know, how many trades did we do with a certain institution last week, right? So their technology, their tech stack enables them to ask questions like, what happened in the past? But if you're going to be a thriving, successful maybe relevant financial service institution in the future, you have to be able to go up and right in that chart, right? You have to be able to answer questions like, what's going to happen? How should we respond? How should we make uh, automated decisions? And the punchline here is that the more uh, you go up and right in that chart, the more data that you need, the more cloud that you need, the more AI that you need, right? So this is what Databricks is helping your customers. And as I mentioned, today there's two disparate technologies that you need in order to do that, right? So to answer questions like, what happened in the past? I don't know, this slide is kind of blown up. Um, you need a data warehouse that puts your structured data in there, right? So this could be your transaction data, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You also have a data lake where you put your unstructured data in there, right? So this could be geolocation data. It could be, you know, cybersecurity, semi-structured data, et cetera, et cetera. They're kind of two disparate uh, technology. What Databricks came around and said, and this is what the lake house platform is, is to say, hey, you can do those things together in a single place. So the lake house architecture is taking the best parts of a data lake and the best parts of a data warehouse and putting it together. So think about data warehouse, right? This is the concurrency, um, the transactionality, the performance, the query performance that a data, uh, data warehouse has historically given you, and the flexibility, the cost effectiveness, the AI that a data lake enables you to do. And the lake house is just those two things combined. And where Databricks fits in is Databricks is the best place to run your lake house. Right? We created the category. We've been in business for 10 years now. Um, you know, it's, it's really the core of what we do. And that means all your data and all your people across your divisions from your organization come together and collaborate on a single copy of the data and use it for productive purposes. Right? There's, it's kind of a missing slide here. This is also this is a really ugly slide that I made, but um, I think kind of tells the story. But, so many of us want to talk about Gen AI today, right? It's, it's I don't know, Barry's going to talk about this in a little bit, but um, it's so critically important, right? There's many, many, many ways that you could go on this path, right? There's, you know, pr proprietary model is like a chat GPT. You might do a little prompt engineering all the way down to, you know, a, a trained model on a bespoke industry and very domain specific. Databricks has been designed for AI from the very beginning. So it's going to be the, the best place, the most cost-effective place, the easiest place to build your Gen AI models, LLM models, to monitor them, and to deploy them, right? 
Databricks is going to be the, the cheapest, most cost-effective, the simplest, most governed way to run and build LLM models. And we recently acquired a company called Mosaic for $1.3 billion, uh, which is a big part of that strategy. Yesterday, we also acquired a company called Archeon um, that helps uh, more govern real-time data from all sorts of different sources come land in the lake house so that you could train and build your uh, LLM models. Right? So this is critically important for us in the future of our, of our strategy. Gen AI is going to be incorporated not as a use case of Databricks, but increasingly in how the product works as well. So for those of you that are a little bit more familiar with like, what the platform looks like, something called Lakehouse IQ, I'm not going to go into it, but Gen AI is going to increasingly be part of the experience of using Databricks as well. And that's going to be a big focus for us um, over the next few years. And before I hand it over to our you know, um, a panel, I'm here because I'm really excited to be part of financial services, right? So I want to a little talk about kind of like what's at stake. And I think that we're at this golden age of financial services, and that's why I'm wearing gold shoes and, and this gold glitter thing. And, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up in Connecticut, and um, I grew up in this small town. And when I went to middle school, I went to this private school, and I was like, all my friends have much bigger houses than I do. Like, why is that? I was like, what do your parents do? They're like, oh, they work on Wall Street. I was like, what did your parents do? It's like, they work on Wall Street. And I was like, oh my God, one day I'm going to work on Wall Street, right? So I grew up having this vision of one day I'm going to end up on Wall Street. And how many of your kids grew up wanting to be bankers today? Not that many, right? But I think that can change. And I think what's going to make that change is data and AI, right? So, yeah, this is the picture, right? And I actually generated all these slides using Dolly. Um, in gold, right? So how many people are going to grow up to, to wanting to be bankers, right? Well, I think it's possible because what, if you think about what Gen AI provides, it's productivity gains, right? That's, if you distill it down to what it can provide to financial services, it's productivity gains. And you think about what that means for an average, let's just look at banks. And there's something called efficiency ratios, okay? Anyone heard of the efficiency ratio? Efficiency ratio is how Wall Street looks at banks. And this is my inner banker coming out again, I apologize. But this is how Wall Street looks at banks. And efficiency ratio is simply expenses divided by revenue. Right? So if you have an um, excess ratio of 50%, that means for $1 of cost, you could generate $2 of revenue. And 50% is considered to be the gold standard. Right? The average bank in America is 59%. Um, percent. But if you think about people being the single largest cost at any financial service institution, and being able to enhance the productivity of those people through data insights, through analytics for, from Gen AI, that 59% no longer has to be the benchmark for people, right? Why does the 50% have to be a good number? Why can't it be 40%? Why can't it be 30%? Why can't it be 10%? 10% is $10 of revenue for $1 of cost, right? Why can't financial services have big tech-like profits? There's no rules against it. It's just that historically, it's been a very difficult organization to really drive value from your data. And I think with all the innovation that's happening today, we're at that uh, inflection point, right? And the core of that is, you know, we have to get the foundation right. So all the CTOs that we talk to want Gen AI yesterday, right? But that's like the eighth step. The first thing you have to think about is to really get the foundation of your data right. You have to get all the difficult parts right. You have to get the governance right. You have to be able to trust your data. You have to do all this. That's where Databricks fits in, right? It's an end-to-end -end platform that starts with giving you the ability to ingest data, to govern data, so that you understand where your data is coming from, who has access to it, what's happening to that data, and how it's being used in a simple platform. That's what Databricks provides. And take a step back again and said, okay, what is the most important asset that your organization has today? Right? So if you, looked at, if you think about a bank, I used to work at uh, Goldman Sachs a long time ago, right? If you thought about Goldman Sachs, uh, maybe Goldman's not a good idea, uh, example. Let's say J.P. Morgan. If you ask J.P. Morgan, what is your competitive advantage maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago? What they probably would tell you is, hey, we have a lot of money and we have a lot of branches. We have a lot of capital and we got a lot of scale. And if you think about what makes J.P. Morgan so successful today, I would argue it's two different things, right? It's capital and scale is still important, but what they have is data and people, right? Data is the fuel of the 21st century. 
and, and people are the talented employees at JP Morgan that can do stuff with that data, right? So today, data and people are the most important asset that a financial service custom company has today. And it's not just in financial service. Actually, you know, Starbucks, you can tell the same story. Right? Starbucks is super successful in the past because they had 4,000 uh, stores. You know, they have lots of money. They built it all out. But Starbucks today, as you know, the Starbucks app is the largest fintech app in the United States, right, in terms of transaction volume. When Starbucks is so successful today because you open the app, and I'm sure everybody here has the app, it propels you to go get a pumpkin spice latte. It looks at your transaction history. It looks at your geolocation. It looks at weather, right? They can propel you, compel you to go. Right? That's just an example of how companies successfully using data in AI very effectively to change consumer behavior, drive revenues. I bought a latte today. It was $8.13, right? Crazy, right? But anyway, so that's what it is. So look at the data in AI maturity curve, right? Again, Databricks is to help here to help you go up that curve as quickly as possible, okay? And this is my last slide. And the, the question is like, why? Why do we even do this? Like, why are you all here? Why are you at this conference? Why do you, you know, have to think about data and all this stuff? Like, what is at stake? And I think a lot of it's theoretical. Gen AI is gonna transform the business. AI is gonna transform the business, like all this stuff, right? But the point I wanted to tell you is there's actual tangible returns for being a data and AI-driven company today. So. About two years ago, Morgan Stanley, I don't know if there's anyone from Morgan Stanley here, but two years ago, uh, Morgan Stanley wrote an incredible research report, and they analyzed a bunch of companies, and they said, companies that are AI-driven, data-driven, and cloud-driven win. So they identified 38 companies, and they tracked their stock price over time, and there was meaningful outperformance for the companies they, they identified. So I read that, and I said, well, that's interesting, because all our cost, Databricks' customers are cloud. Our customers are AI. Our customers are data. What happens to our customers? So I created this thing called the Databricks 30 Index, which is a you know, price-weighted stock index, much more similar to the Dow Jones, um, and plotted that over time. And this is how it's shaped up. Of course, there's causation, correlation, you know, all sorts of different stuff. Right? But the punchline, there's two things I want you to draw your attention to, which is right here, which is like March of 2020. Do you guys remember what happened in March of 2020? Right? So we have the pandemic, in case you forgot. Um, the, you know, realistically, data and AI probably didn't matter until March of 2020, statistically. And what happened? All of a sudden, business had to adjust on the fly. They had to make data to make different decisions. They had to recalculate all the risk factors, et cetera. Right? You see this big divergence since March of 2020. Agility, resilience, all these things started to matter. The other thing you see is that red line, which is November of last year. Anyone remember what happened November last year? ChatGPT came out. And if you actually just started this chart from November of 2020, you see this other divergence as well. Because all of a sudden the market said, hey, AI companies are really important. AI actually matters today, right? And of course, you know, this is a little bit controversial chart because there's com uh, correlation causation yet again. Um, but the point here is that this is what we're here for customers and to work with you on, which is to become a cloud data and AI driven financial service company so that you can have, you know, Starbucks like experiences for your customers, so that you can have big tech like profits for your organization and that you could deliver superior experiences and really take financial services to the next age, you know, so that one day your kids will want to work for a bank or insurance company as well. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to our esteemed panelists. Um, we have Michael Hartman, who runs regulated industries for us. We have Christy, who's the chief product officer of, you wanna go up, of FactSet. <laughs> and Barry, who is the VP at Mosaic, which is the machine learning company we acquired. So, thank you so much. Hey everybody, I'm Michael Hartman, and I run the regulated industries here at Databricks, financial services, healthcare and life sciences, and public sector. Christy? Hi everybody, good morning. My name is Christy Karnowski and I'm FactSet's Chief Product Officer. And FactSet is a data and analytics business. And I'm Barry Dauber. I ran go-to-market at Mosaic ML. As Junta said, a company that's just acquired by Databricks three or four months ago and now lead our Gen AI go-to-market. Great, so Christy, let's start off with you. Um, tell us about your role uh, and FactSet's role in the broader data ecosystem. Right. Um, well, I'm a lifetime fact setter. I've been there for 22 years. Currently, my role is chief product officer. 
Um, any, like any chief product officer, no matter the business, I spend all my time learning about and thinking about our clients' greatest challenges and how those challenges are evolving with markets and what's happening in the world, and then orienting FactSet's teams toward those challenges as our North Star. So the most important thing that I do is empower our development teams at FactSet to make the right decisions about what we ought to build, um, where our clients' needs align with um, something that FactSet can build that is unique and differentiated. So any CPO will tell you it's all about um, building something that's valuable for the client, that's viable for your own business, something you can be successful at. Um, data has been at the heart of all of the solutions we've built um, for, for the last 45 years. Um, and I think what, you know, our place in the data ecosystem revolves around um, being a data aggregator, enabling clients to upload their portfolio data very easily on FactSet and then connect that to other data sets, um, ones that we collect and ones that we integrate from third parties as well. And, and putting that all together makes it really easy for clients to um, make their investment decisions and track them in FactSet. So you, you are a lifetime fact setter, first time I've heard that phrase, but yeah. uh, you've obviously seen a lot of changes in data and in AI. Can you talk about the journey that you've been on, what you've seen? Definitely, yes. There, um, in my tenure in this business, there's been so many changes and evolutions, always getting us a little bit closer to connecting the data to insights and, and you know, transforming information into intelligence. Um, I remember when uh, there was this big swell of interest in alternative data, um, being able to connect things like you know, parking lot uh, images with the performance of retail companies, foot traffic, credit card data, um, bringing that more mainstream into the investment process um, was a big moment. And then also with things like machine learning, cognitive computing, when we could integrate things like named entity recognition, natural language processing, now you could do things with data like um, formulate sentiment analysis on top of an earnings call transcript, or um, look at patterns in data and start to make predictive signals on top of it. So those are things that we took advantage of at FactSet. We integrated them into the product, and I think they were some of the best like, precursors to where we are looking with Gen AI now. Um, and, and these days, it's what is amazing to me is just the um, accessibility and the openness and the adoption of some of these newer technologies, even within financial services, which is traditionally really conservative. But you have a lot of um, open source libraries and frameworks. You've got the rise of cl cloud computing. You put those two things together, and now more and more companies are able to kind of make that leap. And what we see a lot is just the fear of missing out on that opportunity. So. I would say those are some of the, the key things I've noticed. It's a, it's a great point of view from a, from a data company. Barry, what about you? You come at it from the AI perspective. What have you seen over the past few years? Yeah, it's definitely been an interesting time. And I've been in the data analytics ML space for years. And you know, I joined Mosaic you know, almost two years ago, a year and three quarters ago. And when I started ChatGPT, as we saw in Junta's slides, didn't exist. So we were actually selling software optimization to make neural network training go faster. So what was nice about selling neural network training uh, was if people didn't know what neural networks were, I knew it probably wasn't a good target for me to be selling to. So it was a very quick decision point. I could go on to the next uh, client. But then you know, when ChatGPT came out, you know, I, I knew we were onto something when my mom called me. And she's like, Barry, I just read in the New York Times about this ChatGPT. Is this competitive with Mosaic? I was like, holy moly, that's incredible. A, mom, you kind of have a vague idea of what I do now at work. That's amazing. I was like, no, like ChatGPT is the best marketing like we've ever had. And what's interesting about that, and we've all had this conversation a lot, is you know, I, I think it's a journey that our customers have to go on. There's lots and lots and lots of different ways that you can start to interact with the data from a machine learning standpoint and from a, a model standpoint. And depending on the use cases, there's different model approaches. And what Mosaic was focused on was training these models is expensive. And we all see the you know, OpenAI's, Anthropics, and Coheres of the world talk about you know, their $100 million model. 
You know, it turns out most businesses don't need to utilize a $100 million model for them to go look at transactional data, for them to go look at their contracts, for them to go do uh, you know, information retrieval on a knowledge base. It's, you actually care much more deeply about the data that's in your environment. And what our founder set out to do was, how do you make this easier, more accessible, and cheaper? And I like to joke, this is the first time in my sales career where I legitimately sold something that was just cheaper and faster. And it's, you know, we've seen NVIDIA's stock go like this for a reason. You know, GPUs are expensive and hard to come by. So what Mosaic came out to do is, how do we just reduce the cost, reduce the time of training these models? And if we reduce the time of training these models, the models are going to be cheaper, they're going to be more uh, accepting of you know, lots of organizations being able to go utilize them, and how do you train multiple models for very specific use cases uh, versus kind of one model to rule them all? You know, fast forward to getting bought by Databricks, so we're now part of like a unified data platform, because I got asked all the time, they're like, hey, Barry, that's awesome, you guys can train models cheaper, faster, and it can be on my data where I own the model, but like, I'm a regulated industry in a you know, financial services, I care deeply about governance and auditability and lineage of that data. Like, how can you help me with that? And, you know, thank you Databricks for, you know, lofty acquisition, but it's also, you know, about as perfect an alignment as it can be from a, um, you know, uh, product perspective, because we completely slot in in the tail end or, you know, in the middle, depending on how you look at it, from the data processing, the data storage, the lineage comes along for the ride, and then we can basically, everything that Databricks does on the data side, we can now make available uh, for our models as well, which has been pretty transformational for the industries we work with, where they can again now start to own these models. It's no longer sending your data to a third party where you're using models that you don't know what the data was trained on. So for us, it comes down to control, and we provide access for people to be able to control for what they want to do. Great, I mean, good journey on data, where AI is impacting it, right? Gen AI now is all the rage. Everybody's talking about it, CEOs talking about it, boards talking about it. You know, Christy, talk about, you know, there's obviously been a lot of talk here, Money 2020, our CEO is up on stage talking about it. Um, talk to me about, talk to us about the opportunities that you see with Gen AI uh, and the opportunities for FactSet with Gen AI. Totally, and, and Junta had kind of, we were on the same wavelength when you were talking about the efficiency for banks. Um, for us at FAXA, we deal with the world's largest uh, asset managers, investment banks, wealth managers. So for me, when I think about the, the opportunities, it's all about making people more productive and letting people focus more of their time on human interactions that are really gonna differentiate them and help drive their business. That's what I get excited about as somebody whose first job at Faxet was walking around and training people at their desk on how to use our software. Um, so I'm really, if you think about a financial analyst, a portfolio manager, an investment banker, these are um, labor intensive jobs with a lot of manual work that's repetitive on top of vast data sets, um, tons of information in a market who measures its own pace in milliseconds. So it's just a ridiculous amount of work. Um, and it doesn't, Gen AI is the opportunity to alleviate this. So in the same way that nobody's adding up a column of numbers by hand anymore because we've got calculators and Excel, um, we don't really need to spend hours reading millions of news stories, filings, uh, transcripts, all of this stuff, and, and trying to synthesize that into some kind of an insight. We're gonna have bots that do that, and FactSet is, is already down that path. Um, and we're gonna be able to help our users with things like um, building presentations and models and refreshing those things. Um, so that's where I think um, there's a huge opportunity to kind of lift people up out of the, the grunt work and let them focus on more of the impactful human connections. Um, and so yeah, I think that's, that's probably where I see the biggest opportunity in our space. So there's, there's great opportunity, you've identified it. There's also investment that needs to go into that. So how comfortable are you with the investment that you're gonna make that you will get the return you need on efficiencies, on cost savings, on productivity? Um, how do you look at that? I'm, I'm super confident in our ability to um, reimagine the facts at user experience to deliver the, um, 
you know, what I just mentioned, like that productivity gain for our users. I'm really confident in this because we've already gone down that path. We have um, a lot of the steps ready to go. And we're working kind of side by side with our clients on developing our solutions. So we know that what we're building is exactly what they need and is going to be something that works for them. Um, we're kind of taking a step-by-step -step approach um, guided entirely with, you know, by our clients. And that's always been FactSet's approach is to um, you know, partner very closely with clients all along the way. Um, so I, I know that I'm very confident that we'll get there, um, also because we have two of the other key ingredients. We have the data that is critical for our clients. Um, it's, it's what will make the experience relevant for them, and what, no matter what industry they're in, no matter what asset class is most important to them, FactSet has those data sets. So when we provide them with a conversational experience that's going to answer their questions and help automate their workflows, we're gonna be doing that with data that puts that in the right context. And also, we have the, the people as well who understand these workflows um, for, for 40 plus years in this space. Having a true understanding of what that user is trying to do all day is key to this as well. And, and that's something that I think FactSet brings to the table that makes me confident in our ability to get there. That's great. So, you know, we come at it from a perspective of there's opportunity everybody's talking about it. Then they're asking the question, how and where do we start? We've obviously laid the groundwork that it starts with the data. It doesn't matter if it's an application, Gen AI, if the data isn't good, nothing that we, can, we wanna do with it is, is valuable. But Barry, talk a little bit about how smaller institutions can build efficiencies and start to do this. You know, Everybody knows that JP Morgan has all the money and the resources in the world, so they could throw people and dollars at anything. But how do we actually help smaller companies, smaller financial institutions build out their Gen AI strategy? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And Christy alluded to a lot of this. It, it's basically a journey. So we see a lot of our customers start with, and Junta had it in one of his slides, start with you know, proprietary models out of the box to start kicking the tires on what makes sense. And typically, and you know, Databricks can host that, and typically they go from there into RAG or retrieval augmented generation. So how do I start to take potentially an open source model or it could be a model they train themselves and we can help them do that. Plus a vector database, you've heard of you know, WeV8 and Pinecone and uh, Databricks is something called Brick Index that does this as well. And you can basically start to store all your data there and start to train these models. So RAG for lots of instances, thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. And then you start to go down that journey of, okay, that Llama 2 or you know, Mosaic open source model or another open source model is not getting the um, tone or the quality of the outputs that I expected to get. I want it to be in the you know, fact set or JP Morgan or you know, small uh, federal credit union voice, how do I start to do that? You can start to fine tune these models again for thousands of dollars. Um, and then as people go down that journey, and again, there's different approaches for different use cases, it's you can start to move into pre-training uh, those models as well. And you can pre-train models, it's again, not for millions of dollars uh, anymore, and for large, large models it is, but you can get very performant models for tens of thousands of dollars today. And we see lots of small organizations basically start with that. And then as, as we joke or we talk with our, our clients about is we climb the ladder with you. Because to Christy and Michael's point, like it starts with the data. We at Mosaic, Databricks, we can train the most performant model, but if the data is bad going in, you're gonna have a garbage model coming out. So how do we make sure that data mix up front is right for the, the use case you're trying to do? And then we basically train a small model and we climb that ladder together to hopefully get to the accuracy and kind of performance that our clients demand. Okay, great. Well, thank you both for the time today, the insights. I think, I think both Christy and, and Brad, excuse me, <laughs> uh, will be here to talk um, to you, Barry, afterwards, uh, if you have any questions. If not, I'm gonna turn it over to Phoebe Chen from AWS, who's gonna lead the next panel, I believe. Phoebe? 
Thank you, Michael, again, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Phoebe Chen. I lead up our FinTech growth strategy over on the startups team at Amazon Web Services, or AWS. And I'm very excited to be joined with Stephen Sykes from Public and Phil Galloway from Zero Hash to talk about how generative AI is impacting and transforming their FinTech and Web3 startups. So before we dive in, um, Stephen and Phil, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your companies, and how you perhaps how you first got introduced to Gen AI? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for for having us. Um, really excited to talk about this. Obviously, it's an exciting time in the industry, particularly in consumer financial services where we sit. Um, so, for those of you that don't, that don't know, Public is a an investing app, for lack of a better term, and we've made our name around two things. One building you know, aligned business models that help our customers become better investors over time and really focusing on sort of the outcomes uh, that our investors have. Uh, and then the second is sort of enabling that original mission is providing great market data, content, and context on the markets so all of the investors that use public have the best information available to them at all time and I think, or, or at all times. And I think that you know, sort of becomes where we start to talk about Gen AI and, and what we've you know, focused on over the last several months is figuring out how to use the new, the new Gen AI tools to really, you know, synthesize all of the available market information uh, and put that in a consumable format and a consumable UI uh, for our customers. Sure, my name is Philip Galloway, and I'm a head of data engineering for a crypto as a service company called Zero Hash. Um, and prior to that, spent six years at Goldman Sachs um, running their data team for their consumer savings business. And I got into machine learning and AI at Goldman, uh, dealing primarily with transaction monitoring uh, and fraud detection anomaly, things like that. And I think, you know, recently, uh, as different as it is from traditional finance at Goldman to non-traditional finance at a crypto company, uh, you know, I've discovered a lot of the same problems, a lot of the same sort of concepts apply in both worlds. So it's carried across well. Awesome. Can't wait to you know hear more about your your journeys going next. But Stephen, I'm gonna start with you a little bit. Obviously, this year it has kind of been a wild ride with all all of us getting um, crash courses on how Gen AI can transform you know the distribution, the creation, and the delivery of financial services. And at Public, I know you guys recently launched a very cool product leveraging Gen AI, and it's focused on improving retail customers' investing experience. I also had the honor to witness your very awesome demo the other day on Sunday. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that journey creating this product and if there's any you know, key lessons that you've learned along the way? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, been, a, it's been a longer journey, I think, than, than might meet the eye, right? I mean, I think we've relatively recently, called in the last three months, launched Alpha, which is a chat-based user interface. So that's a fancy way of saying chatbot that ingests all of the available market data uh, that we have as public um, and make that available to our customers in sort of a you know, natural language chat, chat interface. And that could be anything from sort of stock quotes to recent earnings call transcripts to research analyst reports to just the breadth of news articles that could be written about the markets on a given day. Um, and so, you know, we started if, you know, that's ultimately where we ended up, but really where we started was uh, before ChatGPT launched, um, summer of 22, as I think we started to see in the industry, a little bit of familiarity with GPT-3 and started to see some back-end use cases uh, of people primarily working on, at that time, it was almost all like customer support bots. And I started to get these influx of pitches from startups that were building customer support bots for financial services based on, on GPT-3. And I remember vividly walking through a bunch of those demos and being like, wow, this is really cool and it's not nearly good enough for us to put into production, right? The too many hallucinations, too much stuff that just didn't make sense. Yeah, every once in a while you'd get something that seemed magical, but like two thirds of the time you'd be like, okay, any of my customer support reps would come up with a better, more comprehensive answer. Then came ChatGPT, and I think, you know, a month after that launched, we had sort of GPT three and a half turbo available on the back end. And really at that, that was a, a huge jump in terms of the quality of those responses. And the pitches I got started to get better and better. And then GPT four came out and that was when we saw, okay, like this is something that's production ready and actually helpful uh, for customers. And, you know, we looked at a, a variety of ways um, to go to market with both sort of an investment research user interface, the chatbot that we have alpha today, 
um, and also you know ways that we could could use that sort of technology to, to improve customer support um, and we looked at all of the you know again there were a bunch of firms and, and, and startups building sort of technology behind the scenes to help us do this and the truth is what we ended up doing was just doing it ourselves and that was I think one of the biggest learnings I've had is sort of more of the business operator leadership side was it's actually quite easy to build against a bunch of these tools, right? I think as you look at sort of the primary technologies that we've built out to Alpha on top of R, just GPT-4 straight to open AIs, APIs, and then uh, Pinecone uh, to do sort of the uh, vector search and indexing. And, you know, on a team of literally two backend developers over the last six months, you know, we've built what is, you know, I think a really incredible product. And you know, in financial services, you can't build shit with two people, right? Like, this is weird. And it's like, you know, in six months, two people is like, okay, m maybe you can refactor some of your reporting, right? Like, you're like, this is not something that I would expect to get a really consumer ready product uh, done in that sort of time frame. And really, I mean, truly, we had our MVP done in about four weeks. And so just the ability, like the quality of the infrastructure as it's actually hitting the market, is far beyond, I think, what we've seen in most of the other sort of S-curves we've seen in our industry in the last uh, few years. I love how, you know, your comment about that constant re reiteration and then, you know, the, the, the time that you took to, go to, for, to develop an MVP. It's incredibly, you know, it's incredibly in short time. And I feel like that's a very common theme that we see in startups. You just have to act very, very nimble. Um, and then you know constantly look at the trend and then and then you know pivot when you can right so I absolutely love that story and Phil just to um, move it over back to you to me I think you sit on a very interesting s intersection witnessing both you know two very emerging technologies that is blockchain and generative AI and when we think about generative AI, obviously you need to have like massive amounts of you know um, context-specific data to train that foundation model. On blockchain, I guess you can kind of call it a great producer of a lot of um, transparent data. So to me, there's really a lot of industry or technical convergence over there. How do you see these two dy dy the dynamic over there play out from an industry sp um, perspective? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're you're right about the you know enormous volumes of data, and you, you you would think that a lot of crypto data and blockchain data would be really messy, and it can be, but just by the nature of it being very open and transparent, it's fairly well defined. It varies obviously greatly by the different blockchains themselves, but what I what I think is interesting is in terms of the marriage of AI and and, and blockchain is, I think there's the possibility that in, when you combine the instant settlement of value aspects of crypto and the cryptographic you know, security aspects of crypto and combine that with the automated decision-making trees of AI, potentially you know, in a world where crypto is more mass adopted and becomes a lot more used by the mainstream, I think you could see a world where automated decision-making in terms of fraud and AML could become very, very close to real time because of the real time settlement value aspect of crypto. So I think I think you could kind of see the two hand in hand, you know, helping each other there. The other thing, that as far as Gen AI goes, that I think is interesting, that's getting worked on, you know, and discussed a lot currently, is around how potentially Gen AI can start to interpret the massive amounts of regulatory documentation in each country, in each region, for each specific use case of crypto. And it's, you know, you, you have to hire an entire army of lawyers and compliance professionals to read through and digest all that. If even some of that could be assisted by a Gen AI model of going through and traversing and looking through the. And just to hone in on zero hash a little bit, obviously compared to public, um, public is you know B two C, and you guys are B two B two C. So um, in contracts to you know public alpha, kind of like focusing on improving end users, you know experience. I'm imagining that the application or the use cases of Gen AI at zero hash will be slightly different as you guys focus on Web three infrastructure API a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about? Is there any specific areas of focus that you guys are exploring or already sort of you know in production maybe today with you know the application of Gen AI? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the one that's the less, you know, exciting to talk about, but is a lot more, you know, real world use case, I think, is developer productivity applications, such as GitHub Copilot and similar applications in nature. Not, <clears throat> not just because that it, it can assist with developer productivity, but I think it potentially fills a void that, um, which is automated test case generation, which, you know, developers never want to do. So in, in, in cases of where, if that system can even introduce some test cases that wouldn't have existed prior, I mean, that is by itself is a very clear, measurable win. And it's also easy to measure in terms of yes or no, right? It's a very clear stick to measure. It either, you know, there's either more test cases or there aren't. Um, the other one that we're looking at is, um, is, is a less gen AI, but a, you know, certainly AI is, is transaction monitoring. Um, and in my experience, I've seen that very use case work really well at Goldman. Uh, in terms of starting with a small use case, I think Barry was kind of alluding to this a little bit earlier, and making sure something works really well, communicating the success of that at the bottom of a funnel at low risk, and then watching it grow up the funnel with more investment and more control and more coverage. Mm -hmm. I've seen that progression work well. So we're, we're, we're starting now at Zero Hash to look at you know, the AML, anti-money laundering and fraud detection models and things like that at a small use case. Really cool. Stephen, I feel like you sort of had like a resonating reaction when, when, when Phil talked about developer productivity. Do you have anything to add there? Um, yeah, I think developers hate to test code. And so if it can make it even a little easier, you know, honestly, it starts to save headcount, right? Like, you know, in the best organizations in the world, in my experience, right, like you actually have quite small QA teams and a lot of it becomes uh, automated, but you still have QA teams. Right, and if we can get to a place where actually, like, you know, you can have real-time automated testing that's developed uh, by an AI bot that sits within the code base, um, one, you save on cost in terms of QA, but you also save on sort of those iterative loops, right, in the context switching that's required when you complete code, commit it, somebody's going to go test it, they're going to come back to you with the fails they found, and then you're going to have to get back into the code base and rebuild it. Like, there's just like massive like cost and productivity, and like that's the thing that like, yeah, I think all you know, some of our guys use. GitHub Copilot, some don't, some like, you know, literally like sit with a you know code interpreter open next to them and like, but like, those are all sort of very. I mean, what, what we found is we've not institutionalized the uses of those technologies. I think we've found those are very developer specific, but where the institutionalization I think will come is like when we get to a place where there's truly a, a QA function uh, that can live entirely in a gen <clears throat> in a Gen AI model. Next, I want to shift gears a little bit and focus on data. Um, obviously, that's like a key ingredient for a generative AI to work. And Stephen, since public is a trading platform, I you know I imagine it sits on a lot of its own proprietary data that you know that you can leverage. Um, and then also, when you think about the stock market, there's are obviously a lot of publicly accessible data that you can leverage as well. But I also see that you guys continue to diversify the product offerings to a lot of additional asset classes, from fixed income to investing um, fractional shares of music royalties, which I think it's pretty pretty cool. And um, the other day, you also demo a little bit about some alternative data, like you know numbers, number of um, cars sold by Tesla, carbon emissions data, that kind of stuff. Which I think some people might say that you know they're it's less data rich and perhaps relatively expensive to procure. So my question for you is, in the context of generative AI and you know using it for a product like Public Alpha. How do you navigate um, managing, you know, such varied data sets, uh, sources, and types? Um, how do we manage it uh, as, as, as best we can? It's really hard, right? I think when you go to market with a value proposition that you want to focus on building, um, you know, great market data and market content and market uh, context for your customers, you're sort of signing up to, like, always be chasing the best available, both like primary information, meaning the trade data, the fundamental data, the filings, um, primary news reporting, and sort of all of the different pieces of information that are derived from that that also drive the markets. So research analyst reports and so on, right? So I think we're constantly chasing those things. I think what, um, you know, what we found and where, where Gen AI can be really helpful there is in two things. One, is the synthesis of that primary data into novel sort of um, derived content. So a good example, like I'm using really conceptual terms, but a good example is, 
you know, if a, you know, there are 6,000 stocks that are available to invest on public, right? Um, the vast majority of those don't have sort of massive active news coverage about what's going on in them on a daily basis, but there is still quite a lot of information about them at the primary level if you know where to look. And what Alpha and Generative AI let us do is run a model behind the scenes that monitor each of those, all of that primary data, and when we see an outsized move in any of those 6,000 names, right, so let's say it goes up by 5% or 10% or down 5% or 10% unexpectedly, our systems will ask Alpha, why did that happen, right? Why is this stock moving? And we'll get back a nice summarized, synthesized response of like, hey, based on the primary data, based on filings and based on, on news and based on the, the fundamental data that we can see, what's driving this and what's explaining it? And sometimes the answer is like, we don't know because it's really not explainable by anything in the primary data, but oftentimes there is a trigger that Alpha is able to identify, put it into a quick paragraph and really explain really quickly to anybody looking at that stock chart, why is this moving this way over this period of time? Another cool example is basically applying the same thing but on a personalized level. So if I own Tesla and I go to Money 2020 and I haven't checked what's going on with the Tesla stock price in two days, which is absolutely true, um, I might come back to public and say, damn, Tesla's up whatever or down whatever and I have no idea what happened. I've lost entire context on the stock that I follow on a daily basis. Alpha lets us say, okay, what has happened since I last visited this page that explains why the price has changed? And we can do that again, very quick paragraph. So it, it just creates a, the ability to create novel sort of interesting content about the markets and really help our members, you know, keep up with the markets in a way that's way more efficient than what they've done in the past. And actually, same topic to you, Phil, um, because like I, I think some people might think that uh, current uh, digital currency and uh, cryptocurrency and digital assets as kind of like a single monolith, but we know that in fact there's a lot of technical complexity across chains, right? So, and also in the context of generative AI, like how do you see? Um, what are the challenges of managing such you know very data sets across different chains as well? Yeah, I mean, I think the use case is extremely similar to what Stephen just mentioned, which is, I mean, I, I feel like half my job and my team's job is, you know, knee-jerking on questions and why is this doesn't look right? Why is this 10% off? What? And it, I mean, if, so if I spend six hours digging through, you know, a mountain of data all over the place to try and find out the one very clear answer of why that happened, if you, if I can save six hours by leveraging a model like that, that's it's a tremendous, you know, gain. And it, it, it's just, it's, it's the same story with blockchain data, right? It's just, it's just compounded by, you know, just variance, right? So, I mean, but at the end of the day, the, the problem is still the same. It's just the more and more data sources, the more data volume you get, the harder and longer it takes to answer those questions that may be very simple, direct answers that just take a while to find a needle in a haystack, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but for, a, for a, an AI model to be able to shave that, even by 20%, 20% is, is worth it, mm -hmm. for sure. Very cool. Um, so I think we have one more, uh, we have time for one more question. So today, obviously, we have heard a lot about generative AI being used as a co-pilot tool, um, used for productivity, used for improving customer experiences. Um, and I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball for a little bit. Say in the next, over the next three to four years, when we have, you know, a more massive adoption of Gen AI in financial services and in the Web3 industry, how do you think the use cases will evolve beyond, you know, the three main topics that we talked about, productivity, co-pilot, and customer experience? And is there any specific focus of areas that you're particularly excited about the future involvement? Um, that's a good question. Um, so I think I will make, I don't think these are particularly bold predictions because the time horizon we're talking about is so long, but I'll make two. One, um, I suspect almost and take every bit of action that a human could do and can, I mean, at this point, even with GPT-4, it's not just, I mean, it's, I would like, it's approximating a customer support rep, but it's approximating, you know, our 80th percentile customer support rep 95% of the time, right? So it's not our absolute best people and it's not replacing them, but sort of 
better than our median in many cases, and it's doing that at much lower cost. So I think that as that continues to improve, like we're, we're gonna have, as consumers, we will have all have access to much better customer support on a daily basis at much lower cost as we build the technology to enable it, so that's one. And the second is I do think, we were talking about developer productivity, I think the institutionalization of, you know, not just QA testing, which we talked about, but also just developer support tools. I mean, I think in order to be a developer in our, you know, startup or software development economy in, in five years, you're going to have to use these tools um, or else you're going to be left in the dust. And so I think everyone's going to have to get up that, that learning curve. And I think it's going to be a massive boon to people like me that show up to our software teams and like, hey, can you build this? And, you know, I'm the guy that like sends them all the annoying emails and iterates scope and does all that. And like, you know, we're going to be able to build a lot more, a lot quicker. And we're going to see that sort of S curve um, really come to bear. It hasn't really started yet. Developer productivity is improving, but more or less at a linear rate, it's going to hit an exponential curve in the next few years. And it's going to be wild to see what that does to the industry. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just like the internet in the 90s and early 2000s. It'll become this very cool thing to something that's literally a competitive advantage that if you can't leverage, you're, you'll be in the dust. Um, and I think everybody can see the writing on the wall. It's good enough now to where it's, it's, it's shockingly good right now. And, and I think it still has quite a bit of ways to go. But by the time three to four or five years, if not sooner, you know, I think it'll just become almost as if it's assumed that interactions with you know, customer service, things like that, it's assumed that there'll be, you know, some type of, you know, chat GPT-like model behind the scenes. I, what I think could be really interesting is around, um, you know, just productivity savings, not just in the workspace, but in personal lives, in all the minutia of things that we deal with in daily lives. I think the minute that, you know, the, the sort of zeitgeist discovers how powerful chat GPT is, more so than they already have, it'll just, I, I think it'll start to permeate every aspect of, of, you know, our lives. And I think that'll be when it really takes hold in people's head. When the minute my mother can call me and say that, you know, she's using, you know, chat GPT or some, some derivation of that on her, you know, phone, that, you know, that that's when it's taken over for sure. Awesome. Steven, anything to add? Yeah, I want to make one more, one more point. It just it occurred to me, I was like, imagine what, how our economy is going to evolve in a world where we are building cumulatively more than twice as much software per year and how that's going to like compound, right? Like, I, I, like, it's just like hard to conceptualize that if we, again, all of us in some way, shape or form work in software, if we just doubled the output of each of our teams year on year for the next five years, like what is the future gonna look like? I, like it's impossible to predict, not even assuming the phenomenal tools that we have to you know, that we can add to the mix here, but like just that fact alone is going to lead to outcomes I don't think we can predict and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely agree, good stuff. Thank you again for joining us today. It has been a great discussion with the both of you and please let's give another round of applause to Stephen and Phil for sharing their insights.